Good day to you. Hope you're having a wonderful day. If you ever wonder, I'm always clicking off about five seconds in my head at the beginning of the video because I want to make sure I've allowed enough time for the recording to actually start because it takes a few a couple of seconds. And if I start too soon, then what you end up with is maybe half a word or something <laughs> at the beginning. So that's the reason for um, those couple of seconds of quietness that you may hear. All right. Um, so last time we had read in the book of Luke, chapter 10, and as we had finished, I'm on the wrong page, pardon me, as we had finished, um, there was the incident with Martha um, wanting Mary to help her and the Lord telling her that, that Mary had chosen the good thing, and it's it's not that he didn't appreciate Martha serving and, and making that sacrifice, but um, but we need to you know, be able to make those sacrifices without being, um, what, maybe jealous or aggravated with others. I, I do understand her point, though. I think most of us can understand that. So, um, anyway, that was the end of, uh, chapter 10 in the book of Luke. Now we're in the book of Luke. We're going to read chapter 11. We're reading for context to understand the events that are happening, and we're also reading to understand what is being said so that we will be able to use this knowledge to strengthen our walk with the Lord, to make us better Christians. If you're not a Christian, then then to hopefully give you the hope of being a Christian and um, to teach you about Jesus and his, his love and wisdom for us. All right. Again, this is uh, the book of Luke, chapter 11, and I'm starting in verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he, Jesus, and he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. This is a simple form of the Lord's Prayer. Um, it hits all the important things that we, um, that as a minimum, we should probably be praying for. Um, we should say, Father, you know, hallowed be their name, praise you, thank you, Father. Um, uh, your kingdom come, you know, Father, your will be done, your kingdom come, we, we want your will to happen here, we want your kingdom on this earth. Um, and we want to come to your kingdom. We want to be in heaven. So um, give us each day our daily bread. Give us the things we need, Father. Help us and help us have the things that we need to get through each day. And forgive us our sins because we, we know that we're imperfect and we make mistakes. And so we say, forgive us our sins, Father. And then we're reminded... For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, everyone who sins against us or owes something to us. We forgive them. We forgive others. So forgive us, for we forgive others. And then lead us not into temptation, because we really need, <laughs> we really need that warning. We really need the Lord. We need God, the Holy Spirit to help us stay away from temptations. It's it's so difficult in this world, in this life. We know it is. And uh, uh, it would be foolish of us not to admit that we need that help, and we do. We, we need that every day to stay away from temptations because there's so many, there's so much. Um, and it may vary. The temptation may vary from person to person, but we all know that there are temptations there. So, uh, continuing on with verse 5. <coughs> And he said to them, this is still Jesus speaking to his disciples, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet because of his impudence, now, and in this case, this impudence 
should also mean um, persistence. You know, it's like a uh, it's like someone who's being annoying, and <laughs> they're just being persistently annoying <laughs> to get you to do something. He will rise and give him whatever he needs just to get rid of him. You know, he will rise and he will be like, okay, okay, fine. I will get you whatever it is you want, man. I will give you your bread <laughs> or whatever. Just go away and let us sleep. Okay, anyway. <laughs> and uh, and Jesus continues in verse 9, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Now he's explaining what we did. See, this is all about prayer. He, was ta he gave them a, a skinny down, a small version of a prayer. And I say, I, I have this thing where I've lately I, I say it's a skinny down version. You know, it, it doesn't have a lot of fluff. It's, it's a direct prayer. But then he says, you know, he's talking. This is all about prayer. Um, asking God, reminding God. Not that he needs reminding, but just being persistent. That's the word. Being persistent, coming back and asking God for these things in faith and believing that you're going to get them. <clears throat> we'll, we'll continue on. Jesus does a better job of explaining than I do. Uh, verse 9, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. And that is true. If, you pers if you're persistent and you keep making the effort and keep trying... All these things will, this is always true. It's, I mean, it's true in life, and it's true in your prayer life as well. Um, just think about it. If you keep making the effort and keep trying, the, that effort, those things pay off. I mean, it, all, it always does. Um, even, uh, even if you fail 20 times before you get it right, you know, or get, get whatever it is done, just the fact that you keep making the effort, you keep getting better, and you keep doing better, and, you know, it's just the way it is. <clears throat> it's the way things work. It still, it still kind of goes back to you reap what you sow. You're sowing in the effort, and you're being persistent and steady, and, you know. All right, so, <clears throat> verse 11, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? He's, he's comparing this as a parent to God. God is our father. He's our parent. Of course, he's not going to give us something bad. And the funny thing about that is even if we ask for something bad, he just won't give it to us because he knows it's bad for us. We may not understand that it's bad for us at that time, but it's bad for us. Verse 13, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And now, when we're baptized, we do receive the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us through the Word of God and tries to help us to remember things and uh, helps us to avoid temptations. You know, we may stubbornly, I know I'm guilty of this, we may stubbornly go our own way and do our own thing even when we know better and the Holy Spirit is like a little witness inside you saying, no, that is not what you should be doing. You know better. And maybe brings a verse up to remind you, and yet you go ahead and do it. And I, I like I say, I'm talking about myself. I've been that way before, too. We all have. Well, I shouldn't say we all have. I know I have, and probably most people have. So, um, but here he is talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, which our Father gives to us when we uh, when we come to Him, we humble ourselves, we um, we uh, accept Jesus as our Savior, and we are baptized uh, into the church, into um, and not not like your local church. You're baptized into the body of Christ, into the kingdom of God. You're baptized into that church, the original church. Like if you look at the Book of Acts. Uh, and you consider the apostles and all these um, churches that they started, all these uh, different ones, different. We're, we're part of that original church. Yes, all those little local churches are churches, but uh, they're all part of the same church, the body of Christ, and we all belong to that. So we're not talking about, when we're talking about church, at least I'm not, I'm not really talking about like a physical building that you go to or just your local congregation 
um, but talking about the body of Christ mainly. <clears throat> if, if we do talk about a local congregation, I'll try to make that apparent. All right, so moving on to verse 14. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some, some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. In other words, he's not casting out demons by the power of Satan or Beelzebub. <clears throat> because that wouldn't work, and... You know, that just means that um, Satan wouldn't even be a problem. His, his, his kingdom or his uh, house would just fall. It would just be a deck of cards just poof down. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now Jesus is making a point to them. If he's casting out demons with the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon them. The kingdom of God is there. And that was part of his and John's um, <clears throat> ministry, especially when they started, repent for the kingdom of God. Is, is he is at hand is here is at hand you can you know reach out and grab it um, you can join it you can be in it and uh, and that's that's still true today that's still what we're really saying today to people who are not uh, who are not baptized who have not uh, been baptized into Christ and 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 taken Jesus as their Savior and and joined us in his church um, that's that's still what we're saying today. Those ever doesn't matter who they are, what they've done, we're still saying that to them. Now, whether or not they accept that, that that is up to them. But that we're still saying that same thing. <clears throat> All right, um, verse twenty-one. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him. He takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Well, see, Jesus, in this reference, the strong man is Satan, but Jesus is the stronger that is here to overcome him and take away his spoils. And his spoils, it, that's us, that's the people, that's... Um, we're all, see, we're all supposed to be the children of God, no matter whether we're sinner or, or saint, it doesn't matter. Um, God has a place reserved for all of us. He wants us all saved. And it's our choice. He's not going to make us do anything. Um, but He is, you know, God the Father, and He wants the good things for us. And Jesus came to take away the power from Satan, to take away the power of sin. And to free us so that we could follow God and follow Jesus and have a, a better covenant and um, and go to heaven, you know, um, be saved and go to heaven. So he also says, um, whoever is not with me is against me. And, you know, that, that kind of makes sense. If someone is not working for Jesus, for God, then he is against them. And whoever does not gather with me, whoever's not working with me to help gather um, and, and help uh, get, get sinners saved and get people to uh, heaven and to accept God and to um, get into the kingdom of God and be baptized, then whoever does not, whoever's not helping me do that, they're scattering, they're, they're saying other things. Any other thing is not, the, is not the same message, is not the same truth. It is not the truth, basically, and it is not helping. And if you're not helping, then yeah, you, you are hurting in some way. <clears throat> Verse 24, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. 
and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So when an unclean spirit is cast out of someone, now this is this is how this is what's being said here. You know, it tries to go find somewhere else to go. It goes through waterless places, which is usually associated with spiritual type of places. So it's not finding where it needs to be. And finding none, it says, well, I'm just going to go back where I came from. Which is, it's going to try to go back to the person that it was kicked out of, it was thrown out of. And it comes back and it finds all oh, everything's you know that person has gone on they've they've tried to live a, a you know they've got everything in order they're trying to put their life back together they're trying to do good things and then it goes and it brings other spirits with it and more evil and they enter and dwell there and the last state of the person is worse because they did not they they started and they got everything you know sort of put in order but obviously they did not guard themselves they did not keep themselves um, safe with the power of God um, so they uh, the spirit was able to come back you know if uh, if they're following God and Jesus um, they would know that they could uh, keep that spirit from them but if you you know if you don't do anything to have a stronger um, if you don't have a stronger belief if you don't believe in Jesus and God um, you're not going to be able to prevent that from coming back and if you think about it temptations are a lot the same way we get tempted to do something that we used to do that we no longer do and uh, if you keep allowing that to come back um, it just gets worse and worse and it gets harder and harder and you just have to but at some point if you want to not have that temptation you have to cut it off and not allow it back in your life and not because those things those bad things we do um, and it could be porn or it could be any number of sins doesn't have to be that it could be lying whatever you will just you will just dig yourself in deeper and deeper into it the more you practice it it's the same with the sowing and the reaping whatever that is if you sow something bad you're going to reap bad and it just keeps getting worse and you just keep building and making it worse and uh, I, this this the the unclean spirit and coming back this goes along with what Jesus is talking about as far as every kingdom divided against itself how he is coming to basically free um, all of us from from Satan and from sin and that if you allow the sin back in, it's going to come in and it's going to be worse. Now, that would also, I imagine that would also apply to demonic possession, though I'm not, you know, I'm not certainly no expert on that. And I don't know anything about that from any practical standpoint at all. Just what I read here in the Bible. All right. <clears throat> Verse 27. But we do need to guard against having that temptation or that sin back in our life. And not letting, we don't want to end up worse than we started. You know, that's the whole thing. So, verse 27 As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And Jesus is trying to keep the focus here. It's not, it's not that this woman was awful or horrible for saying that. But Jesus is trying to keep the focus on God and doing for God and following God's mercy and, and love and how we treat each other. So blessed are those who hear. And I say blessed when I mean to just say blessed, but, you know, that's an old habit. I'm, I'm an old guy from the, from the Southern Baptist Church when I was a kid, so I'm, I really don't have any denominational affiliation but uh, I'm just saying that's my past and I just uh, sometimes I'm going to say blessed because that's what I heard so much in my life but I, I know the word is blessed and that's what I really try to say but blessed rather those are those who hear the word of God and keep it and that was Jesus focus he's trying to get people to come to the word of God and keep that 
verse 29. Let's see, do I need to move this? Let's move this and make sure I don't mess this up too bad. Okay, verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Pardon me just a moment, I'm a little dry. Okay, sorry about that. Verse 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment and this generation, with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Well, Jesus is the Messiah. And... He's telling them, I mean, they you know, they seek a sign, but they're not going to get any sign except for the sign of Jonah. Basically, he's going to he's going to be crucified, he's going to die, and then he's going to rise again. So, um and then he's talking about, you know, the Queen of the South. Well, she came let's see, the Queen of the South, let's see, she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Well, she traveled a long way. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is greater than all. And yet that he, they're not listening to him. You know, the, I'm not saying that no one is listening to him. Obviously, Jesus had a very successful ministry and a lot of people were following him. But he's talking about people who were wanting signs, people who wanted things that he wasn't going to be doing. Uh, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment because, you know, they repented when Jonah preached to them, which is one of the reasons Jonah didn't want to go. But that Jonah is a whole other story, and that will be a good one when we get to it, um, Lord willing. But Jesus, again, is saying some something greater than Jonah is here, and he's, he's referring to himself. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God, and he's there, and they should all be repenting, you know, they should all be repenting and coming to God. You have the Son of God. You have the Messiah preaching to you right there, teaching you. Um, all right, <clears throat> verse 33. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. So, this is referring to the eyes. Okay, the eye is the lamp of the body. Okay, what you take in, what you choose to take in, what you choose to look at, what you choose to bring into yourself, um, that's what's going to fill your spirit and your soul inside you. If you bring in, um, when the eye is healthy, if you bring in good things, if you bring in the Word of God, say, if you read and study the scrolls, and in our case, the Bible, um, and bring that light into you, then your whole body, you will be full of that light. You will be full of the light of God, the wisdom and the love of God. But if you're bringing in bad things, you know, um, if you're bringing in, uh, if you're choosing to partake of, you know, bad, uh, dark, um, evil things, then that's that's what you're going to fill yourself with, and that's what's you know that's what you're going to be full of, and you don't want that. Um, no one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar under a basket. And once once you come to God and you're saved, you know, don't. Don't hide that away. That doesn't mean you have to make a show and, you know, be all fake. We're not talking about that. But just, you know, in your following God, in your walk with God, just let let that love and mercy of God, let that show in just a natural, normal way. And it will. And it will show to people. Um, 
therefore be careful lest the light in you be darkness that just do not partake of all this darkness do not take it into you um, if then your whole body is full of light having no part dark it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light you can actually be a shining example to others um, in how to act and how to be and how to follow God and I know that's asking a lot but we all need to do that um, we, we all need to do that that is uh, part of <clears throat> excuse me that's part of our goal part of what we should be doing as we follow Jesus is setting an example for those who are coming behind us verse 37 while Jesus was speaking a Pharisee asked him to dine with him so he went in and reclined at table the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner and the Lord said to him now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish but inside you're full of greed and wickedness you fools did not he who made the outside make the inside also but give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. So in other words, as a sacrifice, as a uh, sacrifice to God, as a, um, yeah, as a sacrifice to God, give, give as alms, which is like an offering to God, give as an offering to God those things that are within, the, the bad things, you know, because he's talking about, you know, they cleanse the outside of themselves, they they look all clean and they try to look all um, holy and righteous but on the inside they're full of greed and wickedness and you know they want attention and they want money and they want power and they want position and he's saying you know give up those things give up those things as an offering to God you've already got the outside right you know <laughs> I mean you are already got the outside appearance so you know, why don't you clean up the inside and you'll really be good to go rather than being a hypocrite. So, but woe, uh, verse 42, sorry. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. And that's because they're spiritually dead inside. He's telling them, you know, you do all the outward things. You produce the appearance of righteousness and justice. Um, but you neglect true justice and the love of God, because God wants mercy and justice. Not just um, letter of the law type of thing, which is, you know, that, that becomes an issue, and we see that all the time. Um, even just in natural, normal life, you can see that the letter of the law sometimes creates issues that would not be there. Um, but in their case, you know, here the Pharisees are, again, on the outside, acting holy and righteous and doing supposedly all these things that they're supposed to do, yet... You know, what they're really doing, they love the best seat. They want the attention. They want to be in the front. They want to be honored by men. Um, they want the greetings in the marketplaces. And they're really spiritually dead inside. And it's something that we need to be aware of, too, and beware uh, to make sure that we're not that way. Um, I, I don't know that I know anybody that would be that way or that I would even say is close to that way, but it's something we have to be aware of. If you uh, do become a leader of a church or organization and you're, you know, you're the one that happens to be in the front, uh, you know, you need to watch out for these types of things that you're, that you're sincere and that you're doing uh, what you should be doing for the right reasons and not that you're just, you know, putting on a show. I, like I said, I, I'm not aware of anybody doing that, but that was definitely a big problem with the Pharisees, so it's something to be aware of. Verse 45, One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, 
for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel and to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, <clears throat> for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. So here are these people, they, with the letter of the law, they load people with burdens hard to bear. They make it so difficult for them, for um, normal people, <clears throat> to live according to the law and, and live according to God's mercy and a sense of justice <clears throat> through the letter of the law they make things as difficult as possible they build tombs to the prophets and what they're getting at here is that of course you know they had been killing the prophets for you know I don't know hundreds of years I mean we'll we'll see as we read through uh, the Old Testament and we get into the prophets um, so that um, he's saying that they will be charged with the blood of all the prophets um, and he says woe to you lawyers for you have taken away the key of knowledge you did not enter yourselves you did not enter into the kingdom of God yourself you know they have the key of knowledge there they have uh, God's law and God's scriptures and, and the, they know of his mercy and his justice and yet they did not enter into the kingdom of heaven, and they hindered those who were entering. So they were not fulfilling what they were supposed to do, um, and what their purpose was. Verse 53, As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard, and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. They are trying to catch him in something to either discredit him or to allow them to take him and kill him. That was, you know, they, they saw him as a threat. His ministry was very popular. We've talked about that. He had a lot of followers. They were worried for their positions of power and for, you know, I mean, the way they were treated, they were treated, you know, honored and treated uh, differently than, than just a normal person. So they had... I guess in a way they had riches. I mean, I don't know that they had like a... I, I don't know how it worked, so I don't know if they just had a ton of money given to them or if they just had riches through their position and their power and they had a lot of perks. That's what I've always assumed it to be, is that actually they had a lot of perks and a lot of riches and stuff through that, through their position. So, um, But anyway, Jesus to them was a threat. So they're trying to get rid of him, discredit him, get rid of him in some way. Okay, So that is the end of chapter 11. And these chapters are pretty big and they take a while. So I hope, I hope that's okay. I hope uh, you're bearing up good with that. Um, in our next session, we will read um, chapter 12. I want to thank you for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you.